session. Then after that, you are going to have them sit smooth here. That's what we are serving for purposes of presentation. Welcome to our CS. Let's go then. We have our guests already in place in the room. And I think uh, just one and then we start off as we get directed. language interpreters, I think they, they can be seen from anywhere, so we don't know. Children, please come this way. There's a space for you here. We'll serve the place for you. <laughs> so we are ready to go, I believe. Uh, we already have done our prayer. We have our... And anybody standing, there is also space being provided on top. So it's not to worry. We have already done our prayers. We have our guests in, in the room already. I can see Mushimua Horebumaura, is that Senator? I can't direct the of the Children International, that is the Wang Li, our CAS, already seated also, uh, Safarcom Director, and our guest uh, DFID, Tugume. So we are all welcome, but I think we'll be given the right introduction at the right time. When the guest comes in, uh, final guest, another one coming, then we just start off. So we're keeping a one minute or two, I'm told, to hold on. Anybody with a challenge of sitting, please just fix yourself. There's some more space.
I believe you've seen the program, and we shall go by that. This is just a simple opening ceremony and a presentation. Then we go to our breakaway rooms to really interact with the teams of the this summit. So the opening ceremony is going to be very simple, uh, just two, three minutes speeches to just uh, let us understand why we are here, to be addressed by our leaders and uh, the coders, and then we'll have a presentation, and then we'll go into groups for about uh, one and a half hour, like this, where we'll have moderators to organize you, to make your comments, your presentation, digging into the, the paper that's going to be presented here, identifying situations in which disability is or persons with disabilities are in this country according to experiences, then finding out what then could you recommend in view of the gaps that exist in disability in Kenya, what do you recommend taking forward? So that is what you'll be doing actually. So the people who are inside here, I believe, are majorly persons who have been interacting with disability for some time. Issues of disability. Welcome to the PS, Suzanne Mochache, our principal secretary, social protection. So we are ready to go. I think now at this moment I want to give the microphone to the Director for Social Development, Madam Justin Muruki, to take over. Karibu. Thank you very much, very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, our guest of uh, honor uh, this morning, uh, our CS, uh, the Chief Administrative Secretary, the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, Honorable Bahari, the Permanent Secretary, State Department of Social Protection, Madam Susan Mochache, the head office, British Sarah Monsalgori, Mary, sorry if I've uh, uh, not <laughs> mentioned properly. Uh, we have our senator, uh, Honorable Mr. Maura. Uh, we also have the country director, Save the Children Fund, Madam Wango. Uh, we have uh, Safaricom, uh, Director of Customer Operations, Madam Janet, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, as we've already been uh, told, the reason why we are here, we are preparing uh, our thoughts we, uh, we are preparing our issues as we uh, prepare to uh, deliberate on them at the, uh, the Global Disability Summit in UK. And so we, we are trying to uh, develop an analytical status of our country, identify the, uh, identify the gaps that are there, and also agree on the areas that we need all of us to be committed to uh, so this morning, 
I want to take this opportunity. Uh, the cooperation and the partnership that we've experienced in the preparation of this uh, uh, mini summit. What we are going to do today is uh, an outcome of a lot of work uh, between the disability uh, fraternity, we have the private uh, companies, we have the uh, representatives of various donors, uh, and in particular, we worked very closely with DFID in the preparation of this. As a way of introduction, because of time, I would want to acknowledge that we have uh, uh, delegates from the counties, organizational persons with disabilities from all over the, the, the country. We have officers uh, from the, the counties, and we have representatives of various uh, the, um, disability organizations. And we want to take, to take this opportunity to really welcome you and, and thank you. And we hope that at the end of the day, uh, we'll have come up with resolutions on the things that we want to do as, a, as Kenya and as a team. So uh, our guest of honor, I would like to take this uh, opportunity to invite. We've already uh, prayed, uh, haven't we? So I would like to take this opportunity uh, to invite um, Sarah Montgomery uh, from, D D uh, from uh, British High Commission Head Office to uh, speak to us. Uh, I know uh, we are uh, live coverage and she had requested that she needed to uh, allow us to allow her to speak first. So thank you. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. Um, so, uh, Principal Secretary, State Department of Social Protection, Pensions and Senior Citizens Affairs, Madam Susan Machache. Um, on the Honourable Abdul Bahari, Chief Administrative Secretary. Delegates from across Kenya, all protocols of that. Welcome to everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so delighted to be here today to be part of this very important conversation ahead of the Global Disability Summit which the UK, Kenya and the International Disability Alliance will co-host on the 24th of July in London. I'd like to start by expressing my thanks to the Kenyan government for agreeing to co-host the summit, and in particular to Madam Machacho and her team at the Ministry for really excellent collaboration, which will help to make the event a true success. I have to say we really couldn't have asked for more. So we are very grateful indeed. As you all know, people with disabilities around the world continue to face appalling levels of stigma, discrimination and abuse, and all too often miss out on the opportunities that are the right of every person. The disability, Global Disability Summit will be a turning point to allow us to address these challenges. It will bring together leaders from the private sector, from governments, donor agencies and charities to galvanise momentum and commitment to the highest levels, to deliver real and lasting change for people with disabilities across the globe. But for far too long, people with disabilities have been excluded from conversations on policies and actions that affect them and in broader national dialogue. So I'm therefore truly delighted that the Disabled Persons Organisation has been at the heart of the planning for the London Summit and for the event today. We should do everything we can to make sure that this collaboration continues. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to Kenya. Kenya is rightly recognised as a leader on disability inclusion in areas such as legislation, access to education and social protection. I've seen firsthand some of the excellent initiatives that the Kenyan government is supporting. So for example, earlier this year in January, I accompanied Penny Morden, who is the UK's Secretary of State for International Development, during her visit to Marsabit. There we met Rutina, who is the mother of Daniel, a nine-year-old boy who suffers from multiple disabilities and who needs 24-hour care. Through the 2,000 shillings that Bettina receives from the Persons with Severe Disabilities Cash Transfer Program every other month, she can ensure that Daniel receives the vital treatment that he needs. However, I'm sure the reason everybody's here today is because you believe that more can be done, that the level of ambition can be raised, and that disability must receive the prominence it deserves in the present Big Four agenda, and that every Kenyan, whether disabled or able-bodied, is able to reach their full potential. Earlier this week, Susie Kitchens, who is the British Deputy High Commissioner, and members of the High Commission team attended the third annual Legislative Summit in Mombasa. 
During the pre-summit event for persons living with disabilities, a number of progressive recommendations were made that build on the really strong framework that Kenya already has in place. These include the need for authentic and accurate disaggregated data and statistics, disability responsive budgeting, and representation in county assemblies. These are to name just a few, but again, that meeting is another si signal of Kenya's commitment to disability inclusion. Today provides a platform for a national conversation to read what the level of ambition should be. It will identify what commitments should be taken to London in four very important areas. In tackling stigma and discrimination, inclusive education, economic empowerment, and also technology and innovation. But I'm acutely conscious that there's much more than my own department, the UK for International Development, and the UK government can do. We're proud of what we've achieved, but we really do want to build on this. Examples in Kenya include our partnership with Lena Cheshire through the Girls Education Challenge Fund to support over 2,000 disabled girls to access formal education. Our support to the NGO Cupenda to fight stigma and discrimination towards children with disabilities. Our work with Sense International to support their pioneering, pioneering program to screen infants for multiple. And then during last year's election, our support to humanity and inclusion to ensure more people with disabilities were able to cast their votes and more candidates with disabilities stood for election. The UK Secretary of State for International Development has been clear that disability must be at the heart of UK aid and embedded throughout all of DFID's policy decisions. The UK's team here in Nairobi, we are looking to many of you here today to think how we can think through that ambition and deliver on that ambition. Please stand ready to support us as we work in partnership with the Kenyan government, civil society and private sector. So that's all of you here today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to conclude by wishing everybody the best for today's event, for London and for delivering on the commitments that we made. The knowledge, experience and commitment that everyone in this room offers the potential to make disability inclusion in Kenya a reality within our generation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, disability work is a lot, and we there is room for everyone. And for this, we involved everyone. And, that, and on behalf of the private uh, sector that was involved in this, I would like to welcome uh, Janet Atika, the Director Customer Operations Safaricom, uh, to say something. Janet, Karibu. Principal Secretary, Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, Honorable Abdul Bahari, Chief Administration Secretary, Ministry of Labor, our distinguished guests, all protocol observed, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here with you today to speak about something that is very close to my heart. A few weeks ago at Safaricom, we had an engagement with members of Safaricom staff living with disability. These were hosted by the Director of Human Resources, Paul Kasimu, to a quarterly breakfast and catch up, which we do more often in the company. During this event, a video was played of a little boy, probably more than just two years old, playing on a slide. He was dressed like every other little boy, in a denim short and a t-shirt. He took his time to get to the steps that lay
glint in his eyes as he did so. It warmed the hearts of everybody in the room, so much so that there was an eruption of applause. I am sure some of you are wondering, so what about this? What is extraordinary about this boy? After all, the only thing kids do when they go to play at the grounds is to slide on the slides that are there. But this was no ordinary boy, you see? He was missing all the four limbs. He took much longer to get to the top of the slide than every other kid did, pulling himself up each step slowly, using his chin and sheer upper body strength to move from step to step. He must have taken at least a few minutes while the other kids raced up the steps in, in, in seconds. But none of that mattered as he slid down, laughing and enjoying every second of it, just like all the other kids had done. It was a poignant video, and one that drives home a big lesson taught by a little boy, that disability is not inability. He teaches us that we are our own limitation that we can achieve anything we put our minds to, even if we do so in a different way from everyone else. This little boy teaches us that people living with disability can often achieve just as much, if not more than the rest of us, if given an opportunity to do so. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we at Safaricom are trying to do. We are opening doors to those among us who are living with disability. We're giving them opportunity to allow them to challenge themselves, to grow, and most importantly, to live with dignity that comes with gainful employment and self-reliance. In line with the Sustainable Development Goals, number 10, on reduced inequality, we're breaking down the barriers that make it harder for people living with disability to reach their full potential. This means investing in design and modification of our offices to allow easy access navigation, providing enhanced medical cover that takes care of their special needs, and inculcating a culture of diversity and inclusion that encourages members of staff to appreciate the beauty of diversity and advocate for inclusion for all, regardless of age, gender, religion, ethnicity, physical ability, and others. We believe that our company must be a reflection of the communities we serve, and it is our responsibility to ensure that everybody is represented. Recently, in line with our strategic pillar of developing relevant products and services, we carried out an audit of our customer propositions in order to find out whether we have included everybody. Our findings were revealing that actually visually impaired customers faced a number of challenges while interacting with our m platform, which is our flagship. So we embarked on a journey to bridge that gap by making m fully accessible to this segment of the population, a journey that led to the birth of m interactive voice response, and we launched this in December 2017. On the same day, thank you. On the same day that the world marked the in International Day of Persons Living with Disability, it is the start of something exciting for us, ensuring that we leave no one behind, that we innovate with the special needs of different end users in mind, and that we become truly inclusive organization reflective of everybody we serve. In light of this, Safaricom continues to build strategic relationships with various organizations, some of whom are present and here today. These include Kenya National Association for the Deaf, Kenya Union of the Blind, Kenya Paraplegic Organization, the Organization for the Physically Disabled of Kenya, and of course the umbrella body, the National Council of Persons with Disability, amongst others. In fact, so committed are we to ensuring inclusivity of persons living with disability, that we've set ourselves a target. We are working towards ensuring that by the year 2020, at least 5% of Safaricom employees 
will be persons living with disabilities. <laughs> this is a big jump from where we are today. We're humbled to report that actually, this number is 1.7% today. It is an ambitious target. We are ambitious as a company, and we know that we'll achieve a 5% of persons living with disability working in Safaricom by the year we have mentioned. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Director of Custom Operations at Safaricom, I head the team with the largest number of staff living with disability. I have the pleasure of interacting with them on an everyday basis, and I have seen firsthand just how much they have to offer and how much we, both as an organization and as a country, stand to benefit from creating more inclusive workplaces. You just mention at least, just so that we can bring ourselves to the picture, Safaricom has 6,000 employees, and Customer Operations Division has around 77 persons living with disability working in Safaricom. But inclusivity is not tokenism. As much as we're making a conscious effort to hire more people with disability, we are also careful to ensure that we are only hiring those with the right qualifications. It's about... Head of the DFID, Sarah Montgomery, the head of the Save the Children uh, country director, uh, Wang Lu, the Director of Social Development, all the officials who are here, all protocols observed. I'm very delighted to be with you here uh, on this auspicious occasion. I've just come from the legislative summit that brings together members of the Senate and the members of the County Assembly, where we had very fruitful deliberations on the issues that affect uh, persons with disabilities in our pre summit as issued by a very comprehensive uh, uh, communique that has just been alluded to by the head of DFID. I stand here very proud of the fact that the United Kingdom has actually identified Kenya as a country that stands having made progress in the inclusion of persons with disabilities in this region. We feel very honored that the United Kingdom chose Kenya to co-host the Global Disability Summit. Let's clap for ourselves. It means that whatever energies, whatever caucusing, whatever effort that we have been making towards our own inclusion and recognition is surely bearing fruit. Yes, today, persons with disabilities are not addressed as belonging to that other category. If you look at the groups of disadvantaged uh, persons, you always hear women, youth, and persons with disabilities. Our own constitution, which we robustly participated in its making, mentions persons with disabilities a record 18 times. We have made progress. But it is possible to make one step forward and two steps backward. The, the story of persons with disabilities is a story of token inclusion, the story of the undeserving. We have laws, but can we eat those laws? Do they speak to the day-to-day -day challenges that we face as persons with disabilities? And the answer is yes. The challenge is in the implementation. I would want to imagine that this partnership through the Global Disability Summit is to consolidate these gains so that we can have the fruits of our labor coming to us in due course. As we speak today, persons with disabilities when they are in the mainstream, they are treated as if they are tokens, as if they are flower boys and flower girls, poster boys, who are just there to be seen and not to be heard. As we speak today, people think that when they engage persons with disabilities, they are doing a favor that is supposed to give them accolades of being do-gooders, rather than playing their dutiful role 
in ensuring that the rights of persons with disabilities are fully enjoyed by themselves. We still have a lot of challenges. In the last political dispensation, we had over 80 representatives of persons with disabilities within the political class. Today, as we speak, only very few counties represent persons with disabilities, and our numbers in parliament have reduced. A record 17 counties do not have any representation of persons with disabilities. As we speak today, we have a very good provision in Article 54 of the Constitution that 5% of all members of the public in elective and appointed positions are supposed to be persons with disabilities. However, we have seen the misuse of the word progressive as provided in the Constitution. There are no benchmarks to ensure at what point we are between zero and five. This is a matter that we must confront head on. And I propose that the Constitution be amended to remove the word progressive. Persons with disabilities are going to school, they are qualified. This notion of thinking that we do not have the requisite qualification has been disapproved time and again. And if you want to know, ask Safaricom. 1.7% we just been told, all their staff are persons with disabilities. We have not succeeded in having one of our own appointed as a cabinet secretary out of the 22 cabinet secretaries. <laughs> not even one of us is a chief administrative secretary. We appreciate that we have one principal secretary, Josepha Mkobe, but that is not enough. She is alone. She is lonely. She needs to be joined by others who are equally qualified. At the county assemblies, not a single chief uh, county, uh, CEC minister at that level is a person with disability. We have only one chief officer, our very able Vitalis Were Masakwe. We need more of those, and they are represented here in this audience. People at the grassroots seem to be buying our message. Why am I saying so? Because we can see in the number of MCAs who are elected. But there still exists systemic, opaque, and obscure discrimination of persons with disabilities. In fact, those who seem to be discriminating most are the ones who have gone to school. <laughs> Why am I saying so? How can you explain the fact that Turkana County, one of the most marginalized counties in this country, has elected a blind person, totally blind person, Elim Epu, as an MCA? Bungoma County has elected as an independent person, not through a political party, yes. Martin Wanyoni as an MCA with albinism. So people at the grassroots seem to be understanding us. We are challenging stigma and discrimination, but our systems must continuously be challenged. And this is a call that I would want to make today, that we demand a full implementation of the provisions of the Constitution. We have to speak to the fact that most of our buildings are still inaccessible to persons with disabilities. We've got to move from minimalist approaches where you create a ramp that leads to a stair, or where you have a toilet for people with disabilities for both male and female, where doors cannot fit a wheelchair. We have to ensure that the minimum accessibility standards are implemented and that the building code speaks to the special needs of persons with disabilities. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we can make progress. If we have made it, it provides evidence that more can be done. When I look at this audience, I see a more inclusive society. Before, these conversations were only being held in low tones amongst the DPOs. Now we have big organizations like Save the Children, like Safaricom, like DFID, who want to join us. Let's, let us take this opportunity to consolidate our efforts, to work together. And I want to say that we can achieve so much if we do not mind who takes the credit.
we will excel in what we know to do best, and that is championing for the rights of persons with disabilities. We must say every other day, even when there is pushback, even when there is bullying, even when there is intimidation, even when we lack our inner strength, we must keep on going. Because it is not about self, it is about commitment to the cause of persons with disabilities. So thank you very much. I'm very glad we demand inclusion and we really want to say that the time has come where laws must speak to the true needs of persons with disabilities. God bless you. Thank you very much, Mr. Maura. Another clap for Mr. Maura. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, at this moment, uh, to invite the Permanent Secretary, Madam Susan Muchache, to come and address us and invite our guest of honor, Madam Pierce. Thank you very much, uh, the Chief Administrative Secretary, uh, Ms. Montgomery, the head of DFID, Senator Mwaura, my sister Janet Atika, my colleagues in the ministry, all distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm really excited to be here today, and I'm already beginning to feel that uh, the summit is definitely going to be a success. I am very delighted by the good turnout that we have had this morning. I can see a lot of uh, individuals representing very many organizations on this matter of disability. So I am feeling very, very optimistic. At this point, I also want to really uh, appreciate and acknowledge uh, DFID and the UK government for choosing to partner with us in co-hosting a global summit, a first of its kind for persons living with disability. So indeed, indeed, Senator Mwaura is right to say that we have come a long way as a country. We are not there yet, but we have made strides that have made others recognize that as a country we have moved forward. Mweshimiwa, you forgot to mention that we have a lady, Mweshimiwa Teia from Kajiado, a woman I respect because she's also elected amongst the masses as a women representative. Community that has a cultural bias against persons living with disability. So, for that community to elect that lady into a political leadership position is a real demonstration that indeed, at the grassroots, we have been able to change the narrative because of the visibility and the work that we have been doing to raise the awareness on disability. I believe that the global summit is going to help us elevate the conversation for disability at a higher level. We are going to be able to influence not only within our country but influence within the region and indeed within the entire world, developing countries on the issues of disability. So we are, I'm very proud to be associated with this. I'm also very proud to be associated with uh, Safaricom, my former employer, because it is really taken leadership in the private sector in the inclusion for persons with disability. And I hope that other private organizations will be inspired to follow the cue that Safaricom has taken to recruit persons living with disability who have demonstrated that they can deliver, and secondly, to even partner with us as we go to the Global Summit and also participate in the conversation that we'll be having a very important conversation about technology and assistive devices, which is so critical when we are talking about disabilities and empowerment for persons living with disability. While we have... Um, still a way to go. I am very delighted to also share with you, Mwaura, because you raised an issue that is also very dear to us, the issue of accessibility for persons living with disability into buildings. The fact that the cabinet secretary in charge of transport, housing, and infrastructure will be joining us at, in London is also a very big milestone for us. Because as the government leader on the issues to do with accessibility into buildings and roads. He will be there listening to this conversation at a global level, and I want to believe that will also be another serious marking point, turning point for us in terms of having serious champions for uh, issues to do with persons living with disability. So it is not my morning. I want to now uh, take this opportunity 
uh, even as I want to, as I acknowledge and appreciate every person that has been involved in this work, the National Steering Committee that has organized this and that continues to work with us to organize for the summit in London, I want to just assure you of our commitment to make sure that the summit is a success and that, 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 that as a country we are properly represented. We are looking forward to the outcomes of this meeting because you know that we have to be carrying with us commitments on how we will be progressing the agenda for disabilities when we come back home. So I am praying that we are going to have a sex, successful engagement and come out with very robust and very practical and um, leading uh, commitments that we will take with us to London. Na kwa hayo machache ningependa kuchukua nafasi hii kumkaribisha the Chief Administrative Secretary katika wizara ya Labor na Maslaha ya Jamii Bwana Abdul Bahari. Welcome CAS. Madam PS Susan Machache PS Social Service Department for Social Protection. Um, DFID head. Um, DFID head. Um, Madam Montgomery. Sorry for the mispronunciation. Sarah from Safaricom with the Director Operations, uh, Sales Operations. Honorable Laura. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First and foremost, um, I want to convey the greetings from the Cabinet Secretary, Ambassador Kurjatani, uh, who really was planned to be here this morning, but uh, because of other commitments that came up, um, he was not able, or he has not been able to be here. And, uh, as the Chief Administrative Secretary, I am here to represent him today. I must say that I'm glad to be here today. And I must thank all the organizers who have put together this pre-summit. And I want to thank you all again for having come out in large numbers to attend this conference this present. I have no doubt, looking at the representation here, that uh, the outcome of this function or of this presumption is going to enrich our deliberations in London when we get the full summit. So welcome, feel free, and let's engage. I now want to take this opportunity to read the speech of the Cabinet Secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, invited guests, distinguished persons with disabilities, all protocols observed. Good morning. Today we are glad uh, here, gathered here from all corners of this country and beyond to analyze the situation of persons with disabilities in Kenya in the context of inclusion and provision of services that uplift their welfare. Guided by the Global Disability Summit theme, we look forward to discuss disability agenda and highlight some of the milestones, gaps, and recommend further commitments to persons with disabilities in Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, as a country and as a government, we have an elaborate legal framework that addresses issues of disability. And I do not have to list it since most of you are already familiar. We are aware that the Constitution has stipulated under Article 54 guarantees access to education, physical facilities, appropriate means of communication, and the access to materials and devices for persons with disabilities. This is a progressive constitution, given where we have come from, with a lot of entitlements for persons with disabilities. Some of these are reasonable access to all places, public transport, 
and information and to sign language, braille or other appropriate means of communication. These are important in addressing inclusion of persons with disabilities in all spheres of life for and cushioning them from constraints arising from various disabilities. It is regrettable to date that compliance in many areas that could otherwise bring forth many benefits for persons with disabilities are proving to be a challenge and we must come up with strategies to confront this. Ladies and gentlemen, whereas the state is prepared, is required to ensure progressive implementation of the principles that at least 5% of the members of the public in elective and appointed bodies are persons with disabilities, the response from relevant institutions or bodies is, is slow or sometimes unavailable. I think this is a matter which was arti uh, articulated very well by Honorable Maura, um, who also has a responsibility for oversight, being a member of the Senate. And I think the ball still goes back to those oversight institutions to ensure that compliance takes place. Similarly, less than 1% of employees or appointees in public service of persons with disabilities against the requirement of at least 5% in law is what is the prevailing situation. We pray that the new National Assembly and Senate will pass laws to facilitate the implementation of these provisions to help the country achieve the quota and empower persons with disabilities. I am aware that um, government, the executive, has put in place measures to ensure that we receive reports from all um, government departments and agencies on an annual basis on what, how far they have gone on, on, on inclusivity of persons with disabilities. However, like we have said, more importantly now we should be moving forward to ensure uh, a follow-up of these reports and uh, make sure that uh, we, uh, we realize progressively, okay, perhaps faster than it has been, uh, what, what we intended to achieve. At the moment, I believe you are all aware that Kenya is co-hosting the Global Disability Summit with UK government and the International uh, Disability Alliance on 24th July this year in London to galvanize global efforts uh, to address disability inclusion around the world, focusing on consistent and systematic, uh, systematically working with persons with disabilities. It is in this pursuit that we have decided uh, to, to have this pre-summit here to enrich, like Avalia said, to enrich our deliberations so, uh, uh, in the main summit so that we are able to take up uh, 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 leading discussions uh, at, the, at the main summit. This is also the first ever, and I think I repeat, this is also the first ever Global Disability Summit <coughs> by UK government uh, to bring together global leaders and technology companies, governments and charities uh, to tackle the barriers that prevent persons with disabilities in the world's poorest countries from uh, reaching their full potential. And uh, we hope that this will be realized and the, the outcomes of the summit are going to help us uh, uh, push this agenda forward. As a country, we are happy and honored not only to participate, but to play the significant role of co-hosting. Because of this, I'm sure we will carry the flag of implementation of uh, uh, requirements for persons with disabilities higher, and we should now, uh, we are now challenged to, to take the lead in this. Ladies and gentlemen, the Global Disability Summit in July will create a platform and uh, opportunity for government, including Kenya, to demonstrate achievements towards transforming the lives of persons with disabilities and make commitments to transform uh, their li these lives. We therefore 
have to look at our programming and priorities and make commitments to help take the disability sector to the next level. I request that all of you be uh, candid enough during, uh, during uh, this uh, pre-summit and they speak your mind to help dig into the issues and, the ident and identify gaps and make workable uh, recommendations to inform the country towards appropriate commitments to address the inclusion of persons with disabilities. Don't shy away from speaking your ideas here. We must get things right now and not later. Count on me on this. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank the organizations and the agencies that have been instrumental uh, to this summit. These include Safaricom Limited, Site Savers International, Save the Children International, National Council for Persons with Disabilities, uh, Light for the World, United Disabled Persons of Kenya, among others. After this pre-summit, all the recommendations will be analyzed, synthesized, and communicated to concerned stakeholders for validation. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a fruitful and committed discussion today. I do reaffirm my commitment to this course and assure you that I will lead in taking your commitments for the pre-summit uh, to the globe and thereafter request that we all work together to achieve and actualize the rights of persons with disabilities in Kenya and the world. I believe we are going to London, not as Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, not as ministries, departments and agencies of government, not as civil society, not as a, uh, not as a disability sector, but as Kenya. Thank you and God bless you. Another clap for our guests of honor. I'm requesting for an organized club and this this one, two. One, two. Thank you very much. Our guest of honor. Uh, our guest of honor, I want to speak for your indulgence. According to the program, you still have uh, some time when we could uh, look at the the paper that has been prepared analyzing the situation in Kenya. Uh, on the area of policy and registration and the implementation program. This is uh, a paper that has been uh, jointly uh, been prepared uh, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Samuel Kabue, the Disability Caucus for Implementation of the Constitution. Uh, we have Mr. Anderson Itonga from the United Disabled Persons of Kenya. We have the representatives from the Ministry of or State Department of Social Protection. We have uh, Madam Elizabeth Oyugi, the Site Savers International. Uh, we have the National Council for Persons with Disability. Uh, we've had Josephine uh, Itonga from uh, DFID. Uh, we've had uh, Tanya from HI, who have uh, provided us with a lot of secretariat. And uh, a lot, all of you, many of the organizations uh, 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 the, our guests were able to provide input to this uh, uh, presentation and so I would like to request that uh, uh, you allow us to present uh, what has been prepared uh, jointly and I would like to ask my colleague uh, Peter Musaki to make uh, the presentation of the report. Thank you, Madam Director. I don't know if the guests are comfortable uh, seated. We had prepared around here. Yeah, maybe we need to quickly help them to, to sit if they don't mind we quickly, so that they can be able to see what is being presented. Let me, gentlemen, just come to help us make change, quick change here, please. We can, turn, you able to see. we can help carry the chairs. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, the chest we put here. Oh, you can sit, thank you. Sorry for that. Uh, we will endeavor that you get it. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Okay, so this presentation is uh, uh, outlined, as you can see, background to this mini summit, overview of the situation of persons with disabilities in Kenya, gaps identified based on the situation analysis. Uh, so let's go to uh, the presentation again. Now the background to this mid-summit. Now, uh, maybe just to take you off that the Global Disability Summit is taking place in UK. Summit taking place, the global summit taking place on 24th July in London, and it's co hosted by three main actors that is the government of UK, United Kingdom, the government of Kenya, and the International <coughs> Disability Alliance, the umbrella organization. Next. So, the purpose of uh, uh, the summit is to raise global attention, as already mentioned, and focus on a hugely neglected area, and that is disability or persons with disabilities. Another one is to mobilize global and national commitments, like you've already heard from our chief guest, to meet and implement the ambitions set out in the global goals and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Also to showcase best practices. And for this, we have uh, the exhibitions out there going on. So I want to see what can Kenya sell outside there, which organization maybe we can present in London to showcase what Kenya is doing. Next, please. Now, why this summit? This has come out severally. I think our principal secretary has been able to allude to this in the media, as those who have been following. But I'm simply just to prepare Kenya to effectively participate in the Global Security Summit. And the specific objectives of us coming today here is to develop an analytical, develop an analytical country's report based on those <coughs> to develop an analytical country report based on self-assessment. Uh, so, as I said earlier, as I said earlier, we are going to go into groups and then want to assess the situation as it is, according to your own experiences. So we have a... I'm told it's going to come, the, the engineer is working on it, sorry for that again. Another reason is to identify and uh, prioritize gaps. We have to move on because some people have to leave. We are also coming here to identify what are the gaps and how do we prioritize them, like the chief guest says. We must prioritize which comes first. If we identify like five or three, which are the major ones that then are going to take the sector ahead? Number three is to develop a consensus. We are also here today to develop a consensus on the key commitments. So that we are saying, like the chief guest again said earlier, he's happy that we have come and we represented 
can we say this is what we are committing as a country and not necessarily the ministry or the government, but all stakeholders as Kenya. So the expected outcomes of this mid summit, of course, based on the fact that uh, we have then to ratify the situation, the, the, the draft situation analysis report, which I'm giving now, we must then say, going forward, we agree with the situation, situation as reported, and it's good to go to the next level to be taken ahead. Then we are also going to identify and prioritize the gaps. We are going to have the consensus, I think I said that earlier. Next, next. So the ethical framework is as follows. We have the legal framework. That's the main report. We don't have to present the whole of it here. It talks about implementation of policies and legislation supporting the rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, Moshimo Moro was able to mention, I think, and the chief guests and the peers. Availability of data and evidence on disability. We have also analyzed and said it is not good enough. And uh, recently we are already working with the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, not just looking at statistics through census, but also what you call administrative data. As we do our work every day in hospitals, in schools, we have data which comes every day. Programs and services for persons with disabilities and cross-cutting issues. Now, the progressive uh, area of policies, we are saying that uh, the whole of these things are there. And uh, already we have been alluded to that. And most of you who are in this hall are, are able to even list down some of those policies which exist. But then we are saying, what about compliance? Let me just mention a few. Persons with Disability Act, which is currently being reviewed, and I think is in the cabinet. Uh, and also the UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Yeah. So what does it focus on? It focuses on the right to physical access, transport, communication, education, healthcare, employment, and access to justice. We're hoping that's going to be reviewed. Next one is Public Officers Act, which looks at non-discrimination of persons with disability employment. And actually, this is also another gap area. We're going to see how to maybe make calls, like Mora said, we need to have a call from this. Ratification of the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That was in 2008. And uh, for those who may not be aware, that uh, in 2012, Kenya made the first initial report to the Committee <coughs> of Rights of Persons with Disabilities in Geneva. Uh, and in 2015, Kenya was reviewed by being asked questions. So what have you been able to achieve since you ratified it in 2015, 2008? This time round, we are lucky that we have one of us now on that committee, Dr. Ma Dr. Kabwe, someone who is here is going to be making a small statement before you go to the break. Then the constitution of Kenya 2010, which prohibit direct and indirect discrimination on, on the ground of disability. Further, we want 2012, which is being revised, uh, which is revised to 2017, I think. It provides for all this that we can do. So actually, we have a plethora pro of rights, laws, policies, and whatever. Even as we ask Parliament to help us, maybe we should be asking them to do regulations for us, to help us do regulations, to implement. But one thing I want to mention also that uh, the act that we have set to send to the cabinet provides expanded rights as well. Maybe how do we punish those who don't implement is also provided for. And about Parliament will help us to ensure those provisions remain intact in terms of punishing those who don't implement. Because that is where the difference is or the gap. Basic Education Act of 2013, Kenya National Employment Policy 2014, Ministry of Labor and Strategic Plan 2013 2017. It provides for this. Even as we go now 18 and ahead, we just carry. Procurement and Access Disposal Act, and I'm happy to see when I lady here who is the chair of uh, Persons with Disability in terms of procurement. How are we doing it? Are we really achieving or not? Rebel Regulations 2007, Occupation Safety Act 2007, Remuneration and Taxation Act provides for disability as well in terms of employment, in terms of taxation, 15, I mean 15% below and 50 uh, salary. National, I mean income, sorry. National Gender and Equality Commission, what does it provide for inclusion and equality issues for disability particularly? Even as we talk about women and girls and, and young people. National Elections Amendment Act of 2016. It is 
provides for again so much that we can do. Political parties act even as the denominations. Are we doing it correctly? We are told we have really gone lower than we had last parliament. Uh, all this again looks at the cases of Vision 2030 and as a blueprint of this country with major uh, flagship projects that if implemented it actually includes disabilities. Special needs education which is currently under review and I think is being launched tomorrow. We're happy even as we report we have been talking about this being launched tomorrow. National disability policy that is in its final stages of approval. Um, now the implementation has challenges just to mention one, an in an enforcement of existing laws. That is a major, major one that we have to see now. We just don't want to commit and we do nothing. People must be punished for not actually providing for disability. Inadequate budgetary allocation. We have talked about inclusive budgeting. Are we doing it or not? What can we do? Non prioritization of disability in the government planning and processing. Does it just come up by the way, even as we do mainstreaming, or we deliberately do it? as a right. Inadequate capacity of the National Council for persons with disabilities. This is the main government agency uh, under the ministry to, to lead on implementation. But beyond that, is it being effective to carry out its mandate? Lack of implementation of guidelines for policies and policies which have been developed. We have some of the policies but don't have guidelines. Another other challenges, we have low involvement and unstructured engagement uh, with the and state actors. But I, I can uh, assure you, I think from the ministry level and the PS have said this, at least we're really engaging, we're really having a lot of interaction, I think the DPOs, I'm sure the, the chairman is here, and the CEO is also here, there's a lot of now coming together towards forming a kind of structure that's clear. Inadequate collaboration between various governmental departmental departments providing services. We have a lot of uh, break-ins, people are not doing maybe some, we need some coordination so that we, we communicate across all departments to achieve more. Low levels of awareness on disability among some of the policymakers. So if they are not aware, how are they going to provide for persons with disability? That's a big challenge there. Data and evidence. We are aware that uh, we don't have this in this country, we have talked about it. As we move towards the next census, we already work with the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, and I think the piece mentioned this again, we already can confirm, but I hope that's going to be done up to the end, that the Washington group of questions have been captured in the census tool, and the ministry allowed us to participate in that uh, committee, and we ensured it's captured. So uh, we require now training, which is inadequate for enumerators. This time, they must be trained thoroughly to understand how to uh, understand, appreciate, and cognize disability. Use of inappropriate method methodology in that co data collection. Is it really inclusive? Inadequate awareness among the public, among the general public on who, who is a person with disability. There's a lot of argument because sometimes you may not see, you must not necessarily see a disability. Some are not hit, some, some are hidden. Lack of an updated database. We have talked about this for time and I think the council has uh, uh, due to do this, even as we talk about it, that they have a database that is available for the, on disability in terms of sex, disability, disability age, locality, there on this. But as you say here about discrimination and this, what are we doing about it? National Council has a program of mainstreaming, which they go everywhere doing this mainstreaming, sensitizing, creating awareness that exists. But the Constitution also provides for nominations of uh, persons with disability into political positions, national and county level. The recognition of Kenya Sign Language is an important milestone as well, and is a now in law that is recognized as a third, sign, a third language, national. So even as we are seated here, we can see we have uh, that provided for. And it's a requirement that every meeting, we must provide a sign language interpreter and pay them for doing that service for the professional now. Another challenge, empowerment programs targeting stigma discrimination are inadequate, very inadequate. So as we discuss here, we must dig out and find out what are these that we can really provide for in terms of programming. Low levels of public awareness. And it's unfortunate that even as, of course, even as the government, we target other government officials to bring awareness. What about the local person who has not good school totally? How does he know? Local, that lower level. 
no deliberate targeted public awareness. That is what we are talking about. So we need to come out with a targeted approach. Reduction in the number of persons with disability in the national and county assemblies. I think you mentioned that, and it's now maybe very embarrassing because we are going progressively again. Absence of programs addressing disability and in terms of stigma discrimination for women and girls with disabilities. Now, on education, of course, the Constitution guarantees education for all. And this actually is in free primary education, 2003 and three days second school of 2018. National uh, special needs education policy, which is also being revised to really align to the current issues. We have nothing like special. Of course, special can be a street, a street person. As somebody in the, in the refugee camp is also special. We don't talk about that. We talk about education for persons with disabilities. Challenges. Inability to provide appropriate educational support and other appropriate services to encourage inclusion. Lack of early identification, and I think these are major ones. People have gone school up to class three, four, then they are found out to have a disability, so they have challenges managing learning environment in a class of where they have been put. So we require early identification, assessment, and then appropriate planning and placing them. Inadequate monitoring, supervision, and of course, quality controls. Maybe we want to see what the Ministry of Education is going to do to ensure that there is appropriate <coughs> monitoring and that targeting disability in every learning institution. How are they learning? Lack of measures to provide. Reasonable accommodation. Even as we come in, you can see we are also sometimes struggling to ensure the people accommodated even as they sit. Those are the small, small details you may not know. And we have heard from, from Bumura mentioned latrines or, or uh, toilets or washrooms, putting them together and calling them disability toilet toilets. And these things have happened. And it's not uh, that you just mentioned, but we have seen it. So we need to separate and call it accessible washrooms. Not necessarily disabilities. Not a, the toilet is not disabled. <laughs> mm. Lack of lack or inadequate resources to make adaptation to schools to have accessible environment for learners. We must provide. You don't just say the school is here and then you don't do it. Then students not come to learn. Inadequate awareness, sensitization, and education issues targeting parents, caregivers, guardians, the general society on issues of around disability. And learning and, it's, and going to school. What about, what about financing boarding expenses? Because next, because you know that uh, some may not go to school, they may not learn unless they are in an environment where they can stay there because of the transport challenges. So, how do we provide for boarding school for children or the learners with disabilities? Economic empowerment. Uh, when you talk about economic empowerment in Kenya, or generally look at the formal and informal sector. And these two can provide a lot in terms of employment. Uh, of course, social protection is important. Now maybe expanding it and further understanding how does it help empower persons with disabilities. The status that uh, we have provided this in various mainstream statutes and policies. It's provided for, and I think continues again being sometimes uh, revised. Uh, we have article or other government procurement opportunities are we succeeding? Are we really giving persons really the right uh, quota? It is 30 percent. Of course, we are aware that in 2015, the first circular of 2015 has directed 2 percent minimum. Are we achieving that? Procurement of us? Are you doing it? Social assistance programs of social protection. Well, we have now 47,000 persons uh, with disabilities who are benefiting the cash transfer program under the ministry. Uh, is it enough? There are those debates as to whether we should now drop the word severe and look for a different approach. Challenges. The grants currently provided are not enough to make in meaningful impact. Yeah. The 50,000 shillings for a start, people may not really do well because, again, they are put in groups of mothers of children with disabilities or persons with disabilities in a group to pick money and they're given 50,000 by women, enterprise fund, whatever funds. Sometimes with their challenges, they don't do much. Again, they require capacity building. That's also another challenge they have to manage these funds. 
they have those challenges of inadequate training. National Council also lacks the capacity to follow up and to document success stories and also even share reports on what's happening. Those are one of the challenges. There's also minimal impact with regard to improved right to labor market. Of course, you talked about 5%. That's a big area that we need to do. We need to think a way out. And even as the, the act is in the cabinet for discussion, we have the attorneys in the parliament, the public comes in to comment. We find a strategy to ensure that uh, that area is implemented. This progressive uh, idea may not be really working because even as we revise the act, we have said the act says the uh, endeavor. And the endeavoring is what? Because you can keep on endeavoring, endeavoring, and you don't achieve it. Okay? Another one is harnessing technology and innovation. That's an area the PS have just mentioned that it is, it is, it is the issue Safaricom is doing and others are doing. With the technology, persons with disability are home. So the, the government has developed the, the uh, web portal, which provides for accessible information, particularly targeting persons who have visual impairment, like the screen reading. Again, we have companies like Safaricom who have introduced mobile phone, telephony, applications mm, for visual impairment, even up to managing m -Pesa. We have organizations like E-Enable who, who have developed a unique computer program for the blind and the visually impaired projects, but now only in seven schools. Maybe they should not be thinking of how to go beyond. Association of Persons with Physical Disability, the APDK, and the Motivation International, whom we also work with closely, have developed <coughs> mobility assistive devices using local technology. That's very good. We have the Rotary Club of Kenya through the Jaipur project, which, has, which produces artificial limbs that are supplied to the needy at subsidized, subsidized cost. The challenge is here, one, inadequate assistive technology for all. We are saying for all because some, in terms of persons with disability, across disabilities and also within a disability, they get enough. Challenges around access to quality assistive devices. And here I talk about we should run away from negative philanthropy. Somebody just imports wheelchairs and gives out without assessment, without following the right procedures. People have not been assessed and therefore they get body sores on the, with their bodies because they are using bad wheelchairs. So can we ensure that we have a clear process of requesting and you are assessed and then it goes to the person who makes the, the wheelchair, says this wheelchair costs this much to, to fit you. Then you go to the National Council to fund you. Or you go to support whoever is supposed to fund. A clear procedure. I hope this National Council and DPDK and other producers, we can come up with a, a clear system. Because I remember, this was provided for under what you call access project, which APDK, World Vision, uh, Motivation Africa, and others were leading. Inadequate, affordable information and communication in accessible formats. These things are not there. Even as we are sitting here today, we had a request that they give us a, a program for today, which is in Braille, but I've not seen it. They keep saying, oh, we are on the way coming. Enable initiative by this organization is not sustainable because it's actually addressed, it's being done by one person. Suppose that person, Madam Scully Miriam, Kirika somebody, suppose she's not there, what happens? Cross cutting issues, and I will almost through, we have what we call risks and humanitarian context. This is a big issue. Right now we are having floods, we are having fire everywhere, we are having road accidents. Supposing somebody has a disability, how are we handling them? Humanitarian inclusion and Kenya Red Cross have developed guidelines for dealing with these cases. But this is not enough. We need to do more than just grants, and then we must really come out and train people, sensitize people how to do it. Women and girls with disabilities, these continue to suffer stigma and discrimination. Reproductive health services and others. So um, just give you two, three, I mean about a few gaps, and then we stop there. Then we call you to we advise you the next. The gaps we have identified inadequate enforcement of laws and policies which protect persons with disabilities. Number two, lack of national guidelines for disability inclusion in terms of government budgeting, resource allocations, which is clear. Inadequate capacity of the National Council to effectively carry out its supervisory and enforcement mandate. And you see those words, have, we have them. supervisory and enforcement. 
that is supposed to be the, the really major job of the council, going around like a policeman, seeing who is not doing what and taking them to court. And therefore, we expect them to have a strong, uh, what you call, inspector team and a law with, with the lawyers, going around and taking people to court to ensure they, they do this, they do, they really uh, implement concerns as raised in the law. Lack of or inadequate public awareness on issues of disability and an involvement of DPOs, that is the organizations of persons with disabilities. So we want DPOs working with the government to have a clear structure, who is raising awareness where, targeting which region, who, what have we been able to achieve after every year we report. Inadequate resources to make inclusive education a reality. Even as we launch the post tomorrow, I hope and pray that the Ministry of Education are going to progressively or come up with the targeted areas of ensuring this policy is implemented. Maybe like in five years, once you have a big change. Now, adherence to five percent employment of uh, sung about this, we must change it. Lack of inaccurate update data to facilitate effective planning. Without plan, without data, you can't plan. You lose, know, make mistakes. So there are other gaps which are going to come from your uh, side breakaway rooms. And I've decided here that to be discussed during this summit in the in the rooms. Then the commitments, as much as we may think of own commitments as the ministry responsible for disability, working with a few committee which has been alluded to here as a national committee, it's not enough. So I'm not going to list them here because that will be like trying to guide you. We can also think, we want to help people, we want to allow people to think. So what are the commitments that we can take forward? And the cabinet secretary has promised that he's going to take the lead to represent Kenya, not as the ministry, not as the uh, ministries in the government, private companies, but as Kenya, as a state, uh, require, I mean a state delegation representing Kenyan issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, just before, I want to request Dr. Kapui just for a minute to say something to guide Oh, sorry. Right. Somebody, see that? Claire, where are you? Yeah, Claire is supposed to make a, a response to that presentation. Just two, three minutes. Yes, can you take on? This one? Can you? Yeah. Chief Administrative Secretary, Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, Abdul Bahari, the Permanent Secretary, Susan Muchache, Ms. Sarah Montgomery from DFID Kenya, Janet Atika from Safaricom, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Claire Adioni. I'm a lecturer from Strathmore Law School. And I have the pleasure of giving a response to this uh, paper that the government is going to present in London in July. And because of time, and also so that I avoid reputation, I'd like to, first of all, thank you, Peter, for the presentation. And I'd like to thank the team that prepared the paper. Um, I commend them because when I looked at the report, I think it's a very true and self-reflective uh, paper that um, gives the true position of what is happening in Kenya. And so I'm going to answer the specific question that he asked. Among all the gaps and problems that we're experiencing, what are the things that we think should take top priority? Um, in my opinion, the first thing that um, I think the government should address is the issue of access to education. It is a, it's a constitutional uh, provision under the Bill of Rights it's, it's part of, um, and if I refer to Nelson Mandela's um, quote on education, he said that education is the only weapon that we can use to change the world. And yet, free primary education is um, available to all children who, do not have, uh, who have disabilities and who do not have disabilities. But there's just one specific problem that I have noted. If um, a child uh, with disability has to go to boarding school, their parents have to pay for the boarding fees. And most of the, and this is not free. So when you consider that small aspect, it's very small. And um, 
in light of the issue of progressive realization, I think that's something that the government can take within the limited resources to cater for. And the other um, gap that I wanted to talk about, and it's um, important, and I'm very happy that Senator Maura has also noted it, the issue of um, accessibility. And at, mainly in public uh, buildings and offices, I think it's really um, sad that most, a very large percentage of our population is not able to access buildings or offices from where they're supposed to receive services. So I think things like ramps just, and to realize that accessibility, again, I think is something that can be done within the limited resources and in light of the progressive um, realization. So I do not have a problem with progressive realization, I'm sorry, Senator, but what I would like the government to do is with those limited resources that you have, these two things that um, I've talked about, and um, lastly, and this is not necessarily just to the government, this is to everyone in the room, and I think even the media houses. On issue of uh, sign language interpreters, interp um, sign language um, interpreters, sorry. On TV, they have a very small section um, on the lower side of the TV. So the question, and I remember this question um, was actually asked by Dr. Franceschi, the dean of the Strathmore Law School. And he asked, how is that um, inclusive? Because for you, I wear glasses, so my problem is different. But for a normal sighted person, you have to strain to see that, true or false? Yeah, so how are we catering for this group of people in such a limited way? So that's something else the government can do, can write policies on this. Um, the media houses can put a little bit more effort to try and uh, include uh, that group of people um, in that sector. And um, I think that is all I can give um, for now. Thank you for your time and thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Claire and team. And thank you very much, our guests, for giving us time to, to listen to what has been prepared. Uh, our guest of honor, maybe before we break for tea, uh, one of the other uh, team that uh, belong to us is the children. And uh, I would like to request a, a representative of the children interest uh, to come, a child who has something to say in two minutes before we go for tea. Are we there? No. children who are supposed to to come but uh, if uh, that is not the case then I'm going to ask the the save the child uh, fund country director on behalf of the children uh, fraternity uh, to say something okay good morning everyone thanks for the opportunity and the um, all political observed and I think um, today, it's, um, as, a, as actually Director have um, rightly pointed out, it's very exciting because it's one of the actually mini summit in uh, which we have inclusive of children. Uh, I think we have heard a lot of stories and uh, um, what I want to say is uh, we know, not in Kenya, in many families around the world, when the children with a disability, when they are born, they've been um, so there's a shock to the family or out of love and the parents will say oh you know you can't because you're disabled you are you know that's just imagine children grow up in that environment without support there's a, a lot of difficulties to interact with the peers there's a lot of difficulties to also to go to school and I'm really happy to see actually um, access to education because education is a key instrument for children to learn and then to grow up in the future to become responsible citizens to contribute to the society. 
Yeah, so um, um, I would like to congratulate for the organizer actually to make an effort to include children in our discussion and to provide this opportunity for children's voice up as well actually bring the voice all the way to London. And also what we're envisioning is all the parents, everyone actually tell the children from day one, yes, you can, you're just different. Of course you can. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, the, the child, yeah, you can, okay. from Fit the Children. I'm in Form 3 at Little Girls High School. Oh. I'm so happy today to be here before you and just say like, I show my appreciation for the talk because when you say about access, when you say about how to access, because I, I finished my, my primary school, but when, I, when time came for me to go to high school, I had some problems because there are some schools which I cannot fit because of the chairs and the, a lot of stairs, so I can't go up so much. But uh, I want to support that thing that those who are considering about disabled, please just consider us because of the seats. Because I went to a school and found that uh, there, there were seats but the seat when I sit they are too high and my legs are hanging. So I I know that I'm talking on behalf of shorts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And for me I wanna say that if you if maybe if I had a fear, like if I go to the university, which will, which university will take me? Because I I know you have to walk from one class to another and sometimes I get to walk so slow. So I don't know if they can even provide like a service which can be able to transport you from one class to another in order like to save time. <laughs> and also about the chairs, I've talked about them. And also I would like like for our government to like to implement like different schools to accept girls with disability. Because for me, I like, I was stressed out. I didn't know which school will take me because I will go and they will say, let her come first for us to see her. So if the government can maybe make some, make a normal schools to have spaces for girls with disability or anyone with disability, like you can have your wheelchair and be in a normal school. So if they can do that for us, we'll be so happy. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Wairimo. The pleasure to take you down. <laughs> no, I, I think we need to remain here as we grow for tea. I would like to ask this team. Though uh, of defeat, you need to come here. We need to have a group photograph as uh, uh, we move out for tea. Oh, Mr. Kabwe, you. Oh, there's something you want to announce? Okay. Okay, hi. Yeah, but after this, you take a photograph. Thank you. Mr. Kabwe, here. Um, I was asked to say something about the next sessions that we are going to have. We are going to divide ourselves into five groups. And we had said that the registration will be given a number, and that this might have escaped the notice because I think there were several people registering. Peter, is that the case? So we now may have to ask you to go to uh, the session that interests you most, but we will close doors if one session is getting too full. Uh, what are we going to do in these sessions? We agreed from the start that this was not a kind of a conference where we want academic papers presented 
we want to give people opportunity to speak their mind and we want where possible to share experiences not in a formal written you go to speak for 20 minutes is what you can say in two three minutes and the whole idea is to pick out what is it that has been achieved what are the good practice that we have in this country what are the gaps in other words what needs to be done and thirdly what are we recommending the government to make commitments to because we may not do everything that needs to be done but there must be priorities which will make real difference in the lives of the people so we have facilitators moderators and those who are also called facilitators in those groups they are not supposed to give long papers we are supposed to stimulate discussion this is the first time we are coming together the government the non-state actors including organizations of persons with disabilities and other organizations that provide services and as was said we are talking as kenya i'm glad at the kind of presentation that was made here by peter is quite a real self analysis critical analysis of looking at ourselves where we have done well and where we have failed now we are going to look at that in very short where you come from what is it that has been done well two what gaps are there what could have been done better three what do you recommend as a commitment that the government as well as other non-state actors including the private sector you heard what safaricom is doing what commitments can we call to ourselves so those are the three issues that you'll be considering in your group discussion the first group is on stigma and discrimination where you may deal with the issues of women we may deal with the issues of uh, psychosocial disability and issues that touch on us too much on stigma and discrimination the second group will be dealing with the issues of education in inclusive education our focus is mainly on inclusive education the child who has talked i can't remember her name uh, she talked of how can we be accommodated in the normal setting how can the schools be prepared for all children to be able to take part and to receive inclusive appropriate and um, uh, good quality education the third area is our own common area of economic empowerment which includes what can we do to sustain ourselves employment as well as business and so forth and the fourth area is harnessing technology and in harnessing technology we have had for instance what uh, uh, persons with disabilities uh, how they are being considered in some of the institutions technology is in all area of information communication <coughs> even in the area of uh, mobility like we have heard of the wheelchair the jaipu foot and so forth so and then we have two cross cutting areas when you are in those we, by the way we have a fifth area where we are dealing with issues of children and children will discuss all these four areas together so we have five groups not four and then cross-cutting areas is that relating to what Peter talked about um, uh, situations of risk what is happening to people with disabilities in Tana River today what happened to people with disabilities in Sobukia 
Solai, Solai was the name. What happened to people with it? We never hear about people with disabilities. And we also don't hear about people who sustain disabilities out of these disasters. So this is a cross-cutting area that you all need to think about. Then the other area is that of women with disabilities. The multiple double jeopardy discrimination in which they face. Whether we are talking of education, employment, or in the stigma and discrimination, you find all those combinations. So I'll ask Peter to tell us exactly which rooms we'll go uh, so that we don't waste a lot of time. And uh, we will cross the room. When the room gets full, you'll have to go to another, uh, to another room. Thank you, Dr. Ari. You can just stand here, Irene. Uh, the first group is the uh, stigma discrimination, Kifaru, one. Uh, inclusion Education, Simba Auditorium, here we are, we are, we will come back here. Economic Empowerment, we have a tent directly here on the other side. Innovation and Technology, Kifaru 3. Inclusion of Children, Kifaru 2. 